we got a few people still joining us, so we're gonna get started in literally a minute. Um, and thank you so much for being here this evening. And uh, I agree, Montu, I hope everyone is happy and healthy this evening. So I appreciate you sending that love out in the chat. All right, y'all. So we're going to get started this evening. Um, if you have some people in mind you think might want to join us, you could send them the link real quick to the Zoom. Um, Anthony Downer did that last week, and we got a surprising amount of uh, last minute participants. So I thought that was a really effective strategy. Um, my name is Amelia H. Wheeler, um, and tonight we're going to be talking about teaching reparations here on T3 Thursdays. And as we kind of come into this space together, I invite us all to rename ourselves, our Zoom names to indicate our pronouns. So you do that by clicking the three little dots in the upper right hand corner of your um, Zoom tile. You'll see um, it says rename at the very bottom. And then you can just add your pronouns in there. And then that way we can all address each other the way we wanna be addressed. And if you're like, I am still confused, um, you know, feel free to drop in the chat if you need some more time or some more instruction on how to do the pronouns. And as I kind of give you all a moment to do that, uh, I'm going to introduce our wonderful host, uh, Sierra, who's the representative of Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement, uh, where we're joining you live from the Justice Center in the mall. So Sierra, um, thanks for having us. And could you tell us a little bit more about AADM? Okay. okay. Good. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. The mission for Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement is to encourage fair treatment of people of all races, bring awareness to inequities, and advocate against systematic practices used to repress or cause harm to particular groups or individuals. AADM strives to break the cycle of systematic discrimination in schools, the criminal justice system, or the business environment with the focus on racial and social issues. To fulfill this mission, AADM develops sustainable programs, provides resources and runs workshops and trainings that foster positive social change. Teaching the truth is important by working not only to fix the problems of today, but for future generations. Our purpose is to teach the whole truth and not avoid the aspects of history that make us uncomfortable. I would like to pass the mic over to Dr. Chaplin Cole. Okay. Thank you very much, Sierra. And while I appreciate uh, the, <laughs> uh, the doctorate, I do not have a doctorate. I am not a doctor. Um, I don't even play one on TV, um, but good evening. Uh, my name is Chaplain Cole Knapper, and it is my honor and privilege to introduce our instructor for the evening. Um, but before I introduce her, I want you all to understand just how powerful this person is. Um, for me, I, for those of you that don't know, I am a, an Athens native, born and raised. I'm a product of Clark County schools, um, but because I wasn't taught the full truth about our nation's history in my advanced placement American history class at Clark Central High School, I didn't know that there is a racial caste system in this country and that every day I am in fact judged and treated differently simply because of the color of my skin. Because I didn't learn that, I experienced racism, prejudice and discrimination that I was ill prepared for when it happened to me in my life. I don't wanna see another generation of American children have to suffer the pain and indignities of being dehumanized simply because of the color of their skin. So today, as a proud Georgia uh, born and educated person, as a double Ivy League educated and historically black educated, black Athenian and American, I am proud to say that I have a world-class education that started here. 
That education lets me know that no matter how bleak the past, Americans are destined to unite. We are in the middle of a civil rights movement and tonight's instructor is gonna present a powerful class that will help educate us as to reparations that are not only important, but absolutely essential to the future of our country. It is our love of country that drives educators like the one who will be teaching us tonight. Before I introduce our educator, I want to give you a little bit of background from Rethinking Schools. As of the middle of August, more than two dozen states have introduced and 11 states, including Georgia, have enacted rules or resolutions or bills that restrict the teaching of history and contemporary social realities. Now, right-wing activists have mounted similar attacks at school board meetings throughout the country. And this stunning barrage of legislation and policies aims to ban teaching critical race theory, CRT, and supposedly divisive topics in the curriculum. But we know in this room, in this area, in the state of Georgia, that the real target is the truth. The anti-CRT campaign echoes the big lie that the election was somehow stolen. It is the curricular counterpart to the wave of voter suppression laws promoted by the same far right political forces that have tried to rewrite the history of the 2020 election and cover up the attempted coup on January 6th. Although the particular framing of these laws varies from state to state, they are all a part of a coordinated campaign of repression meant to enforce a simple emphatic message to educators, shut up or else. Now we know that the sponsors of these measures fear that in the wake of last summer's massive Black Lives Matter protests, the anti-racist debates and discussions that have permeated society are seeping into our classrooms. It can't be stopped. But with scary buzzwords and misleading framing, both right-wing and corporate media have amplified and spread the perception that classroom teachers are somehow poisoning the minds of our children, inviting a wave of harassment against our teachers. Some of these provisions have been so sweeping, one can imagine teachers finding it virtually impossible to follow the law, even if they wanted to. For instance, in Tennessee, teachers are prohibited from even including any material in the curriculum that pr promotes division between or resentment of a race, sex, religion, creed, nonviolent political affiliation, social class, or class of people. What is that even? This law would make it impossible to teach. Thomas Jefferson's letter proposing the colonization of formerly enslaved people outside of the United States. It would make it impossible to teach about Andrew Jackson's justification of the Indian Removal Act or Franklin Roosevelt's second Bill of Rights speech. The penalties for violating these teaching bans have ranged from fines levied against individual teachers and revocation of their teaching licenses to withholding state funding and rescinding accreditation of school districts to the threat of law school lawsuits by parents. After the Zen Education Project, coordinated by Rethinking Schools and Teaching for Change, invited educators across the country to pledge to teach the truth, we, the undersigned educators, refuse to lie to young people about United States history and current events. That pledge, that pledge was signed by teachers and educators all over this country. But in response, a right-wing website published the names of roughly 5,000 educators who signed that pledge and organized a hit list by state and community. Since then, we have heard from hundreds of teachers who have received hate mail, online harassment, complaints to their administrators, and calls for their dismissal. A longtime teacher in Tennessee was fired in June after teaching two lessons about racism, including ta Coates's essay about reparations. So tonight we needed to bring you a powerful educator to bring you this lesson. We fear and expect that 
those people will not be the last casualty of this war on anti-racist teaching. But tonight's educator is a woman who is responsible for organizing the Teach to Teach the Truth rally here in Athens, Georgia, that was held on August 27th, 2021. And if I had known my history when I was growing up here in Athens, I would have understood how powerful it was that that rally was held on the University of Georgia's campus. What I didn't understand that it was also the site of Linentown and that is stolen land for which reparations are owed. Tonight's instructor is responsible for bringing together, together the amazing Hattie Thomas Whitehead and Bobby Crook of Linentown, as well as historians, Dr. Jim Garrett and our very own righteous freedom fighter, Mocha Jasmine Johnson. Thanks to Amelia Haynes Wheeler, bringing together all of those powerful people, Mocha Jasmine Johnson of the Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement invited Amelia and I to imagine a world where Georgia leads the nation in teaching, in teaching teachers how to teach in new ways, in transformative ways. Georgia has a chance to lead this country in the peaceful, nonviolent battle for the soul of our nation. We must let education, truthful, shared, painful history lead us out of the darkness and disunity and into the light and beauty of this nation's future. Tonight, I call on the ancestors of Amelia Haynes Wheeler from Forsyth County, Georgia, and all that we know that Oprah taught us that that means, we invite her to come and join us in this place and let the spark from her lesson on reparations ignite a fire in the hearts of those who hear her. She is powerful and she doesn't know how awesome she is. Ladies, gentlemen, siblings, Amelia H. Wheeler is a social educator and teacher organizer who is currently pursuing her doctoral degree in social studies education at the University of Georgia. Her research, teaching, and organizing focus on cultivating powerful community spaces that support teachers' capacity to engage in anti-oppressive and culturally responsive teaching. Amelia has lived and taught in Athens, Georgia for 10 years. And she previously taught social studies in Clark and Gwinnett counties. Shout out to Cedar Shoals High School. Outside of teaching and organizing, Amelia enjoys camping, listening to music, and cooking with her friends and her partner, Drew. Teach, teach the Truth Thursdays is about having so much love for this country that educators from all over this country, particularly the South, are pledging to teach the truth in their classrooms. Tonight, on behalf of Mocha Jasmine Johnson and the Athens Anti-Discrimination Movement, I proudly introduce our guest instructor for tonight, Amelia H. Wheeler. <laughs> Let's give it up for Chaplain Cole, y'all. I'm like, that's a tough act to follow. That was just the opening speech. Um, so welcome to Teaching Reparations. I'm glad that you got a little bit of backstory of how we're sharing this space tonight and also, you know, the stakes and the possibility um, of being here. Um, so I was really inspired if you were all here last week, some of you were, I know that uh, Anthony Dower, our uh, amazing presenter, he started with a song of the day. And I was like, wow, what a really clever way to kind of open up your topic. So I decided I was going to open up with a song of the day too, but with a twist. Um, you all are going to pick um, one song that you're interested in listening to about reparations and I'll send you into breakout groups and you'll get to pick which song you want. And as you listen to the song, so you'll listen by clicking on um, the link in the PowerPoint and you can access the PowerPoint um, right here. But you'll pick one of the songs you wanna listen to. You'll listen to it. It might be nice to read along with the lyrics if you like, which you can also click. And then I invite you in your breakout group to uh, just have a, a small discussion. Um, 
how should we teach about reparations for Black Americans if we take the point of view of this song? What would this musical artist um, have us think about what we should be teaching um, or how we should be teaching about reparations for Black Americans? And the way that you'll respond after you and your group kind of have some discussion is you'll click right here where it says click here to add your group's response. And you'll see that we have what's called a Padlet. So I know my teacher friends, you're already really familiar with Padlet. It's a great tool. And so after, let's say you listen to Gil Scott Heron's song, you and your group kind of discuss, well, what is Gil Scott Heron kind of suggesting how we should teach about reparations? You're gonna kind of think of somehow uh, a way you could summarize that by putting it on a little sticky note. And so you click this pink plus sign right here down at the bottom. And then you can write anything you want. Um, I think whatever you want. You can add a picture. So we're gonna start um, this evening a ongoing process of building knowledge together on this Padlet. All righty. So um, I'm going to open the breakout rooms and what you're going to do is you should be able to select which breakout room you want to go to. Once you're in the breakout room, you're going to listen to the song and have a discussion with the folks that you choose to be with. Are you all seeing the breakout room open? Is it popping up for you? All right, someone just joined something. Oh, I did. I spelled Saul wrong. Sorry, you all. Chaplains cho chose a, a room. Matt and Barb has. Morgan has joined a room. Becca, Montu, or Samantha, if you need assistance joining that breakout room, you can let me know. Oh, okay. How do you do you? Oh, you're Samantha. That makes sense. All righty. Are you going to join one, Beth? I'm trying to. It says in progress. Oh, okay. All right. Well, let's. It seems like most people are in their rooms. Are going to be able to um, um, engage. So I encourage you listen to the song, read the lyrics, maybe, and then with your group, help us think about this question. How should we teach about reparations for Black Americans by responding on the Padlet? Let's take about five minutes. You can drop, or you can... Oh, yeah, I can assign you, Beth. Yeah. All right, perfect. All right, y'all have fun. There you go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it oh, hello. Hi. Good. Okay. So, um, so I'm going to go to actually. So I actually went to speed the class. Oh, you did? So I didn't. Yeah. I want my money back. I'm going to have my money back. Maybe like five minutes.
song's really good. What do you think about it? I think it's amazing. Do you, I, I was like, is I didn't want it to be like flippant, but I thought it had like a really like it like it, it says a lot with a little words. You know, I went to school with Stacy Abrams, right? Y'all know that, right? <laughs> Stacy, yeah, Spelman College, <laughs> <laughs> and Saul so went to Morehouse. So. <laughs> I know it. I listened to it like on repeat walking Mr. Spock after I talked to you, Chaplain Cole. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Wow, that was, that was the video is captivating. His face yeah, is very. I'm definitely playing that for my kids. I'm glad that you cared. Well, that's, that's why I couldn't pick a lot of the other songs about reparations. I was like, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to like put that out there. I already swore last week. <laughs> <laughs> I, I caught that. And I was like, okay, Amelia. But like, it's it, okay. We were teachers talking to other teachers. Yeah. I was turning up about standardized tests. Um, but like, what do you think Saul Williams would say about how should we teach about reparations? Are you asking me that question? Yeah, like, that's kind of like what I hope, like, we kind of start putting on the Padlet. Okay. It's like, it's like a up to you kind of thing, you know? I feel like the first thing that his song made me think about was like, it's the economic dimension of it. Like, I want my money back. I'm down here drowning in your fat. Like there's yeah. something like so immediate about that. Like we should be talking about like the economic ramifications and like very much tying that to reparations. Yeah, I think to connect the systemic racism to, you know, and economic injustices to reparations. Right. So maybe can I like put that on the Padlet? Yeah. Okay. Connect. So how would we say it? Like connect. Well, it's, it's all about justice. Like mm -hmm. we understand the systemic racism and we see the economic. So the justice part of making things right 
is reparation. Right. So how would you like summarize that? Wait, say that again, because that was good. I know it was good. <laughs> well, so we, these are established truths. Systemic racism is, an, is racism is an established truth. And the economic injustice caused by systemic racism is another established truth. So you put those together. We all want to do the right thing, right? We're all about social justice and making things right. How do you make things right? So systemic injustice, systemic racism is an established truth, and so is the economic injustice it perpetuates. Perpetuated by the systemic racism. Yeah, perpetuated. Every time I thought it was going to get longer. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. That's good stuff. I think that you're awesome. Awesome teacher in the classroom. Well, I like to think so. Mm -hmm. Probably depends on who you ask. <laughs> and so I'll say, like, from the Saul Williams song. Or maybe economic and systemic or something like that. That's a good song. No. I'm going to get that online. I'm going to be going back and looking at it. You know, sure, he's probably like, I wish mean, she was paying attention to me when I was, when we were in school 30 years ago. Yeah. So. What the hell, Saul? I'm sure he. Just fine. That means. All right. Do you think that was enough I'm time? I think I'm going to call people back because they'll have a minute. Yep. And nobody. I am adding it to my history quiz. This is awesome, by the way. I'm glad you like it. I hope. My fault. Welcome back, folks who are coming. Um, as you rejoin us, I encourage you to hop on this Padlet, and I'll share the link again with us. Let's see here. You can access the Padlet right there. And I feel like everyone else is joining us. Welcome back. I'm always glad when people take that extra time in the Zoom room because I know it means that they're enjoying their conversations. And so as we come back, I want you all to hop on this Padlet with me. And I want you to think about what was your musical artist kind of arguing? How would that musical artist kind of say we should teach about reparation? So for example, if you look at the Saul Williams song, this group kind of thought about the way his song talked about how the systemic injustices of racism have created economic um, injustice. And so that any conversation of reparations needs to make sure that that connection between systemic injustice, systemic racism, and economic um, disparity is tightly woven. So I just invite y'all to spend, let's say another two minutes and try to add something to the Padlet. You click that little pink uh, plus sign in the lower right-hand corner. And if you're confused by the question, you can uh, also speak up, but like what would your song try to teach us about how we should teach about reparations for black Americans? Does anybody, would anybody prefer to share their answer out loud, maybe instead of typing it? I see some anonymous people on the Padlet, so that good, that's good. Maybe it means you're typing. And as you type and think, I want to talk a little bit about this. Um, painting on the background of our Padlet. This is a beautiful piece of art called Black Wall Street, A Case for Reparations. I mean, it was done by a um, 
uh, Black artists uh, in memorial of the Tulsa uh, massacre and the reparations that they actually um, ended up winning. So if you look, you see that there's this really beautiful uh, Black family sitting on a couch and then there's a baby looking the other way. And if you look down, you see there's a bullet ripping past their legs and kind of blowing up the couch, indicating um, what happened right in this massacre. And thank you, somebody said that they thought that their artists might be demanding, we want 40 acres and a mule, which is of course famously referencing um, the reparations that were promised when people who were enslaved after the Civil War were freed and they were promised to be given a 40 acres and a mule, a promise that was never materialized. And so since that proclamation, there has been activism in our country around the issues of reparations for black Americans. Um, looks like we'll move on if other folks uh, are still typing. But we're gonna talk a little bit tonight and we'll continue to return to this question is why are we here tonight, right? Chaplain gave us, Chaplain Cole gave us a really powerful setup. And I think it's important as we continue to talk about how we can teach about reparations, why are we here? Um, I'll share with you a framework that I built out with a co-author for considering one way we could integrate reparations into the curriculum that we uh, engage in public schools. Then I'll let you guys all spend some time investigating some curriculum that has um, been used to teach reparations so we can talk more deeply about this question, how we can teach this topic. Um, and we'll end with some uh, final discussion and kind of thinking about moving forward. How can each of us, whether we're teachers, whether we're um, community members, community leaders, how can we all find a place to teach the truth um, about uh, reparations? Because I truly, as Chaplain Cole said, this is you know a, a movement of our lifetime to be a part of. And so we all have a role to play. Um, so I wanna start a little bit with our whys. Why are we here? Um, I am, as Chaplain Cole alluded to, I'm from a town called Cumming, Georgia in Forsyth County, which is a suburb um, about an hour north of Atlanta up uh, 400. And growing up um, there, I, it was always kind of talked about how we were an all white county. And um, when I would ask why, nobody would ever tell me. And that really bothered me growing up. It was something that people kind of talked about in hushed tones. And when I started to ask questions, they would kind of just tell me to be quiet. And kind of like the most information I ever got was like, Oprah came to our town before you were born and there was a big protest. And this was before really the widespread availability of the internet and certainly before YouTube. And so I didn't really have a lot of resources to learn the truth about the history of my own town. And so as an adult, I became really curious about why was my town an all white town and why was I, what did happen with Oprah, right? And then I started to do some digging and I found out the reason that Oprah came to our town was in um, 1987, there was a um, civil rights march in coming Georgia to essentially protest that from 1912 to 1987, not one black person had lived in our town because there had been multiple lynchings that went unpersecuted. And that in 1921, um, thanks to this reporting by Patrick Phillips, we see his book right here, who's also a native of Forsyth County. It came to light that the original um, reason that there were no black people in my town was because there was a essentially an incident in 1912 where a white woman was found beaten and unconscious and uh, the law enforcement, the white police officers quickly rounded up the closest black men to the scene who were young men, 16 years old, not, you know, not even really men, still children. They were lynched, three of them. And after that, um, all the black residents in our town were forced to leave and their property was stolen and taken and remains in the hands of prominent white citizens. And from that day in 1912, uh, Forsyth County remained a sundown town until 1987. That's when we had um, civil rights leaders like Hosea Williams. He came, he actually got arrested on our town square. We had large numbers of counter protesters. So you can see we had 20,000 people on our little town square. Um, we had very violent, vicious, racist um, in Klan outfits, um, marching to keep Forsyth County racially pure. And this was history I never learned. And for me, 
I grew up in ignorance. I truly believe that that produced in me, um, it dehumanized me to lie to me as a white child about this. And it indoctrinated me into a system where I was benefiting off of a system unwillingly that I didn't even know about. And so as I stepped into myself as an educator and as I learned these truths to myself, there are many reasons that reparations for Black Americans is the appropriate choice beyond just my very small fraction of experience. But this is in many ways the why that I come to this work because I know even in my own town where I grew up, that this happened, that this was real, that it was violent, and that this happens on a magnitudal scale across our country. And I also know that if we look at the interracial collective effort that pushed back, that there's power there. Um, so after this protest, uh, Forsyth County was not a sundown town. They had to majorly change their policies. So I think I also am joining this work knowing that there is power in our collective efforts and that we can really do something powerful if we continue to talk about this topic. So I want you to think a little bit now about your why. We're from different social locations here in the room and in the Zoom room. Why is it important for you to think about teaching reparations? And as you think about that, again, I want you to kind of use that as a piece of data to add to our um, Padlet. So as you think about your why, how should we teach about reparations given your why? So I might say, we need to teach about reparations in a place specific manner, right? Because given my background, I can see how when we understand the pragmatic concrete details of an injustice, that the case for reparations becomes crystal clear. So as you think about your why, I encourage you to add something to our Padlet. How does your experience help us think about how we should teach about reparations in our schools? Oh, wonderful. And I see some more responses down here that I didn't see before. So that's exciting. And I really appreciate the folks who added stuff from their song analysis that they're kind of complexifying our ways of thinking about reparations. We, they need, reparations could mean compensation not only for physical labor, but also the extreme violence enacted on the souls of black people uh, through this brutal regime of a racial caste system that Chaplain Cole alluded to in um, the opening speech. And you don't have to be super eloquent in this. You don't have to, oh, wow, somebody added a meme. You're very fancy. Right, it's not fair. So when this person thinks about their background, their why, they realize that this was patently an unfair system and that you can't ignore it, right? And so their why is how should we teach about reparation? We should highlight the unfairness of this. I wonder if anyone else wants to add. Looks like everyone's off, so that's perfect. So let's keep going. Um, I wanna share with you now a framework that me and a co-author developed. Her name is Chantelle Grace. She's also a social studies doctoral student along with me. And um, we worked together on this project of thinking about how are reparations being talked about in social studies classrooms across America? And what would be the best way or maybe one good way to incorporate the work. Overall, what we found was a deafening silence about the topic of reparations in any sort of published um, social studies curriculum we could find. Of course, we were unsurprised to find it lacking in all state standards, um, but we were very troubled to find that in uh, official social studies uh, lesson plans created by things like the National Council for the Social Studies, among others, there was no discussion of reparations for Black Americans. 
really the only discussion of reparations that we could find um, was a discussion in curriculum around the reparations that Japanese Americans re uh, received for their incarceration during World War II. So every surviving descendant and member uh, of Japanese uh, incarceration survivors, they actually got $40,000 from our government in the 80s. And so when me and Chantel started to realize the difference that there was a total silence around this topic of reparations for black Americans in social studies standards and published curriculum, um, we understood that it was important to help teachers think about ways that they can bring these topics into their classrooms. Um, and um, we worked together to develop a framework. I'm gonna jump on the chat because I see some people responding. Yes, excellent. Yeah, it's proof that it can be done, exactly. So Becca pointed out, or Beth pointed out that the reparations that Japanese um, incarceration survivors received is proof that reparations is a feasible plan, right? Because often we know it's very much couched as this is impossible, right? Um, and we know that it's not. So here's the framework that me and Chantel came up with. Number one, when reparations are introduced into a curriculum, the framing is never, is reparations for black Americans justified? So there's no, we're not gonna bring the topic into our curriculum in a way that positions it as a debate. So there are social studies researchers, um, Hess and McGovey, they call this a closed issue. So instead of presenting this as an issue, potentially that students might debate, should this happen or not, this, frame for integrating reparations into the curriculum would say that it's important to frame reparations as the just, appropriate, and necessary action and not a topic up for debate. Um, and we wanted to make that clear because the very few resources that we could find about the topic of uh, reparations for Black Americans posed the topic in such a way that it sounded like a highly charged debate. Essentially, it was engaging students in even considering if this was the right choice or not. And me and Chantel wanted to really make clear that we don't think that that's a great way to frame the question. We think it's important, again, to present it as closed, not up for debate, but rather a topic to explore and envision with. Another part of our framework is um, making sure that when we bring in the discussion of reparations into our classrooms or into our conversations, that we situate reparations as a contextual practice. So, um, Reparations are practices that states across the world engage in. So for example, the United Nations has five categories of reparations that it recommends for states to engage in when it abuses the civil or human rights of its citizenry. And so we wanna make sure, we wanna counteract the tendency to represent reparations as an abstract kind of topic that free floats, but we wanna say no, just like um, my story, just like the story of Town that the call for reparations is situated in very specific contexts. And so one thing that we'll see later on the lessons is actually just like reparations for uh, the Japanese incarceration victims, we've actually had reparations be um, administered and allocated in smaller contexts. So for example, the Tuskegee syphilis um, experiment survivors, they received reparations from the federal government. Um, black farmers received reparations for the federal government because they were discriminated against in their farm loans. We know that the Tulsa race massacre uh, survivors, they received reparations. So when we can ground the discussion of reparations in specific context, it has a lot more teeth and we're able to talk in, about the issue in a much more direct, clear way than again, positing as this kind of free floating abstract debate. And then finally, me and Chantel, because we're both social studies teachers and we kind of frame this as a social studies topic, even though we really hope it's taken up in a multitude of disciplines and spaces, we thought it was really important that the way that the ref, uh, movement for reparations was taught was, again, positioned within um, what one historian calls the long civil rights movement. So the idea that Black people and their allies have been organizing for reparations since the ending of enslavement 
that this has been an ongoing movement that is still happening, that that's an important part of the way we talk about reparations. And again, making sure that the call for reparations is situated in tandem with the acknowledgement that systemic racism and economic injustice have colluded into vast financial disparities between white people and black people and have been created an incredible amount of wealth for white people that is undue. So again, kind of just to summarize, in whatever capacity that this topic comes into the curriculum, and again, whether curriculum is you're a teacher or maybe the curriculum is the conversation you have at Thanksgiving this year, um, we suggest that we think about presenting it as closed. We're not, it's not open for debate, but rather it's what do we do? We suggest thinking about it in contextual ways. What was the injustice and how can it be remedied? How was that already happening? And we suggest about thinking about it in a terms of a long ongoing movement that is in tandem with larger movements for justice. And so now I want to share with you all um, some ways that others have talked about bringing in reparations into a social studies high school curriculum. So again, I'm gonna let you decide which uh, resource you would like to uh, experiment with. So. Um, you're going to hop on that link to the PowerPoint I sent you, and you have two options. Um, one of my frameworks for teaching is feminist pedagogy, and so a big part of feminist pedagogy is we want to give people choices. So I like to build that in. And um, so you're going to decide if you want to do teaching reparations as civil rights struggle, or you can decide to look at a lesson called How to Make Amends, a Lesson on Reparations. And I I'm going to send you back into breakout groups. You're going to read the lesson plans. And I want you just to think about what lessons can we draw from this resource about how we should teach about reparations for Black Americans. And again, after you and your group have uh, a conversation, I encourage you to add something to our Padlet. Because again, this Padlet is a way for us as a group, as a community, to build knowledge about this that we can carry with us. So give me one moment as I reconfigure our breakout rooms. If you're a teacher who um, has been doing online teaching, I'm sure you're very familiar with how this moment feels right now where you're kind of like trying to buy time. And um, one thing that you could do as we wait is just maybe like preview both lesson plans to see which one you would prefer to like look at. All righty. So I'm going to open the breakout rooms again, and you're going to decide which one you would like to explore. The first lesson me and my co-author um, produced together. And then the second lesson is a product of the Zen Education Group. So you can decide you should have just got a push notification on your Zoom screen uh, asking you which uh, breakout room you would like to join. Do you all see it? And if you don't see the breakout room invitation, you can just type in the chat which one you want and I can put you in there too. So if that's easier, we can do that. All right, Matt and Montu has picked, Beth, Chaplain Cole and Barb picks what they'd like, perfect. All right, so let's take about 10 minutes to explore.
Kelly. I'm going to get to teach with her next semester. She's Why be, is that? She's an ESL teacher, so we'll have a collab class. So she'll oh, have, we'll have a lot of uh, language learners in the class, so we both teach together. I'm, oh. I'm so excited and looking forward to it. <laughs> oh, that's so awesome. She's the best. Really great. Um, Mark, can you see the, the screen? Okay. Um, I'm just going to take a second and read this because I haven't read it. Hello, Samantha, if you go by Samantha. Hi, I apologize. I had to jump on a meeting with a candidate that I forgot about. And so I'm just coming back and I know we're supposed to discuss something, but I'm not sure what the discussion question is.
Matt, what was you saying? I cut you off. You said feel free to. I said feel free to head back when when you need to. Oh, okay, okay. Got you. Yeah. Maybe we're. Oh, okay. And and like I wonder, Montu, like, do you feel like this is a topic you could bring into peer leadership? So, yes. It, it this is my first semester, kind of teaching these both these classes, so. My my ultimate goal is to kind of like infuse these classes to a point where I'm teaching my ethnic studies uh, mm -hmm. students, peer leaders, and my peer leaders to understand ethnic studies more. You know, I like it, I'm fine. I'm trying to find a way to like build that bridge there. So okay. yes, I I think so. I think there are going to be some topics where. We could do some, you know, some hands-on learning and some project stuff and all that and like really incorporate, incorporate it and actually have it almost not be one class, but at the same time, like concentrate a little bit more peer leadership here, ethnic studies there, but they're both learning, you know, so. Um, yeah. I, I'm, you'll learn from me. I'm, I'm a wordy person, but so yes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So Montu, uh, he teaches peer leadership and ethnic studies at Cedar Shoals. And so I was asking him, is this something he thought he could talk about in peer leadership too? And so he was just elaborating how he's trying to start to bring those courses together. And I think that there is something really powerful about, especially about the topic of reparations in that it has been a movement that has been sustained by Black people and their allies since the ending of enslavement. So there is something, uh, a quality of leadership there, as well as a quality of ethnic studies. Um, so I would love to talk more about that. Um, so we're wrapping up a little bit tonight. And I just wanted to kind of open it up to a more general conversation around some discussion questions, because I think we have really smart people in the room. and. Um, I think the best thing that I can do as a facilitator is really capitalize on us continuing to talk and share ideas. Um, so I think my questions I wanna ask y'all um, are, you know, what should reparations curriculum look and feel like? Like, like, what is it important about this kind of topic? Like, how do we want people to feel when they're doing it? What do we want it to look like? What do we visually wanna kind of put at the fore? Um, where are other places we might incorporate this topic? So other subjects, maybe if you're not a school teacher, where are places in your life where you're like, you know what, like I could really talk about this more. What might be some barriers to the introducing this into the curriculum? How might we navigate them? And then like, why is this important? Why are we, why is this something we care about? So um, if you want to talk, you can, you um, just unmute yourself and jump in. You can sh share out in the chat um, or I can call you. I'm just kidding. I won't cold call, but um, you can pick the questions that you're the most interested in. So we don't have to go in order, but um, let's take about like five minutes before we leave here tonight and just consider some of these. Someone gonna be bold and brave and go first. Any of the discussion questions you can pick that you would like to respond to. And if you kind of need some inspiration, you're always welcome to go back to that Padlet because then <laughs> we've been talking about this all night. So you can pick there too. I'll go. I think the most important thing we should do is start talking about it because I don't think it's talked about in classrooms or other places. It seems a little tab taboo. I don't, I don't know why. Well, I do know why, but um, I, I think we just have to start bringing it in and talk about, um, I mean, we have fairness this idea of fairness, this narrative of fairness woven into the tapestry of our nation with this one exception. And so I think we start there and just saying, does it make sense? Can we talk about it? Is it, let's let's talk about this idea. Let's talk about other ways that it's work. Um, you know, if, if you, if a company does damage to you, they have to pay. We've paid other groups of people already in our, our history. So why why isn't this something that we can discuss? Mm -hmm. So I think we just start by putting it on the table and talking about it. Yeah, 
Yeah, and to Beth's point, like I think about as a scholar of education, how how many teachers in their careers were told, well, it's taboo to have um, a woman writer or a black writer on your syllabus. It's taboo to talk about um, so many things, right? And like, we've heard this as educators before and you know how we do talk about a lot of things we didn't used to, it's because people did it anyways, because they were brave, because they pushed the boundaries yeah. and that they knew as teachers, like there is a risk when we engage topics that are divisive. And at the same time, we have a lot of latitude to be subversive and to bring these conversations in. So I just appreciate Beth for pointing out like, even talking about it at all is huge because it is not a topic that is being discussed readily in American uh, classrooms. And this is the truth, right? Like we, this reparations have been allocated to various groups in our country's history. That's the truth. It's the truth that black Americans have been organizing for this for hundreds of years. That's the truth, right? And so I just appreciate Beth for just being like, you know, recognizing the taboo and then saying, like, let's bring it into the conversation. Um, I wonder what you all think about, like, what are some other spaces that we might bring this conversation? Um, what are maybe some barriers? So, you know, what are some of these questions that were up here on the group discussion slides that you'd like to respond to? I mean, the obvious way is politics, you know, I mean, which, it's almost parallel with education and all that, but I mean, we have to start talking about it more. And and, and it, it like again, we we in our breakout when we're talking, it it comes and it goes, but it has to, it needs to be a, a, a stable conversation, um, as well as with your family, the kitchen table talk, the you know the the, the talking, you know, uh, to your children, to your cousins, to your you know, have that conversation. Um, just I. I it's sort of like what Beth Beth saying. It just we re, we really just the conversation has to actually be talked about. Like we have we have to have those conversations in in various of of, of forms and 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 in places and spaces. So um, we just have to have real honest conversation um, in in all those different spaces. So yeah, there would be obstacles, but I mean, like you were saying, there's there's been obstacles. Like that's just we got to like knock the barriers down and just keep going, you know, um, seriously. Yeah. Matt, were you going to share something? Yeah, I was, I was going to share something similar. What Montuch just shared about just ha having these conversations more, more regularly. And so that, when we when we put it out there it's it's it doesn't doesn't you know cause cause more reactions or cause people people to i don't know uh uh be afraid of, of these types of conversations because because we're, we're more accustomed to them so uh so so i think in some ways i don't want to say like it, i think about normalizing these conversations but 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 not normalize in such a way that that it loses it loses its charge. It loses its necessity. Uh, so yes, yeah, that's, that's one thing I want to put out there. And then also, uh, and also, I'm thinking about empathy. So I'm thinking about like when to push, like like how hard do we push, and and how do we also like bring people in, bring people into the conversations, and also people who might like myself included don't know a whole lot on these topics of just learning. So those who are learning uh, like I am, or those who are even newer to it, how do, how do we bring folks in? Uh, and I think, that, I think that refers to one of those questions too. So I really appreciate this group and this conversation and you're sharing with us tonight, Amelia. And, and uh, I'm sorry, but I, got, I got to run. I got something at seven. So thank you all so much. Thanks brother. Thank you. You want to hop in, Chaplain? I really appreciate Matt. And I heard some really good conversations in the breakout rooms too. And so as we kind of finish up tonight, I want us all 
Um, I got a little inner organizer in me. So we're always trying to push it to the next steps. If you're an organizer, you know what I mean? <laughs> so um, I want you to think for yourself, whether you're a teacher, community member, sister, daughter, brother, dog owner, whatever role that you imbibe in this world, what is one concrete way that you can teach the truth about reparations in your life? And so I invite you just to share in the chat, like now that I'm thinking about this, what's one concrete step I can do to, to continue to just bring this topic up and like where might be places to do that? So um, let's take about a few more uh, minutes to maybe type that in the chat or share out loud and then uh, we'll call it a night. So yeah, where, where can you teach the truth about reparations? So what I love about our responses is the ways that we're thinking about, and this was something that Mocha spoke very eloquently um, about at the Teach the Truth rally that really instigated this um, series, is that we can teach the truth in many ways. And so Beth says, I can talk about it in my classroom and with my family. When Beth talks about it with her liberal but very white family, she is normalizing this as something that's just appropriate and the redemptive step for all Americans to heal this fundamental wound in our country. Um, it's the way as especially white folks that we can um, be better ancestors than my ancestors were. Um, I see Chaplain Cole says, I'm meeting with the Clark County District Superintendent in the morning and I'm going to invite her to teach the truth. So again, like using those positions of power and those connections to continue to push this on the table, like Montu was saying, um, Montu says he's going to talk to his children and put it strategically in lesson plans. Um, I think being mindful about how we said, like how we're opening this up to folks, how we're engaging it strategically, maybe talking about it in context where it's already happened talking about groups who have already organized around this, have made plans. Um, and I just, uh, Barb says, I would like to find a children's literature book that speaks about this and share it with my step-grandchildren. Exactly, Barb. I think these are all ways that we can be activists. So you don't have to be in the streets, you know, yelling into a megaphone to be an activist. Like all of those things y'all shared in the chat that is a form of activism. That is bringing the topic of reparations to the fore, the urgency um, and the necessity of that. So I encourage you all to continue with these action plans and really try to put them into practice. So in closing, um, I wanna uh, encourage you all next week, the incomparable Damaris Dunn, she's also a graduate student in my program with me and she is just a rock star. She is a student of Dr. Patina Love, um, who is a world renowned educator and Damaris is in her own right very much um, becoming one as well. And uh, next week she's gonna share a lot of um, research that she's done in the UGA archives. Um, about Mary Frances Early, who was actually the first black graduate of UGA and she received a graduate degree in education um, uh, for music. So um, I just encourage you to sign up using this link right here. You can already go ahead and get yourself signed up. And um, you can go ahead and start sharing this with your friends. If you think that this has been powerful for you, yeah. This would be great to share. So thanks a lot. My name's Amelia Wheeler and I hope to see you next week and keep talking about reparations, y'all. Bye. Bye. Woo. <laughs> thank you, Matthew. Later. Thank you, Bye, y'all. Thanks so much. <laughs> and congratulations on Hip Hop Harmonic. Bye, Barb. It was good to see Bye. you again you so too. many times this week. See ya.